very nice to meet you again. I'm glad you have accepted our, our invitation in our merry group. Uh, we have prepared, uh, 2022 is a new year, a new opportunity to raise the awareness on our new project. Uh, it's not, new, not actually that new. It has started like two years ago, but it's still going on. It's still a going on process. The bill is uh, at the, the bill uh, on the implementation of the directive uh, 1023 of 2019 is still um, is still at, uh, at the, its beneficiary, the Ministry of Justice. Uh, there are talks uh, about it um, and uh, most probably the Ministry of Justice will uh, hand it to the, to the Parliament to the to the legislative uh, authority uh, so that uh, it will become it will be passed uh, into an act, a law by mid-July. Uh, so, uh, we have taken this opportunity to organize another conference, another conference on, uh, <laughs> on the directive, uh, first of all, to raise awareness and uh, secondly, to, uh, to discuss the solutions uh, we have proposed and uh, the Ministry of Justice has accepted so far uh, on the implementation of the directive. And um, one of the topics that has uh, raised a lot of talks, uh, especially in the business environment, bank, the banking environment, the turnaround uh, associations, was the notion of uh, affected versus unaffected claims. Well, uh, I think this is a hot topic everywhere in Europe. And uh, as you can see in, uh, in the translation of the bill, our option was uh, to uh, to have affected claims, not affected parties or affected creditors. It is, it is true that the directive only speaks of affected parties and affected creditors. Uh, so far, uh, have you seen any similar approach in other European jurisdictions? Uh, the easy and quick answer is no. Um, However, it, this doesn't mean too much, uh, just in case that you will repeat this kind of questions, have you seen it already in another European legislation? I, I can assure you and I can, can give you the comfort, uh, you are by far not the only one who are coming up with a new legislation only in the mid of this year. I learned from Brussels that there are still 23 or four um, applications pending or, or have been handed in that the prolongation of one year should be granted. So it's only, I think, apart from the Netherlands and Germany and who else is it? Is it, is it Italy and Greece who have it's come up with, with the transposition? Um, and the rest is still in the in the wake of of of, of uh, preparing it, so feel very comfortable with what you are doing. It makes a lot of sense. I I think this approach of of uh, uh, looking rather to the claims than to the uh, persons behind the claim makes a lot of sense. Uh, well, uh, if you if you would allow me just to uh, to uh, expand on the idea. Uh, our our legal tradition in insolvency, not because we don't have pre-insolvency. I mean, what we have has not been very functional so far. Was to consider claims, uh, whereas a creditor may hold more than one claim. Now, the easiest example that comes to my mind is uh, a creditor that has a secured portion of the claim and an unsecured portion of the claim. In the judicial reorganization, uh, that creditor would be entitled to cast actually two votes, one in the class or in the category of secured claims and uh, another vote in the category or class of unsecured claims. Would that approach, in your opinion, be consistent with the objectives of the directive? I mean, we couldn't find any, any, yeah. any opinion to the contrary. Yeah. It, in my understanding, it makes perfectly sense. And, and I don't see any obstacle from the directive or from even uh, 
any any logical argument why you shouldn't do that this way. I mean, begin with the simple way. Uh, think of a creditor who has a claim, secured or not, um, let's say from a loan, and another claim from a tort. So why shouldn't this creditor be um, treated as a creditor who has two claims and who has therefore the right to, to vote twice in two categories or in one he's entitled and in the other not because this has been exempted from the from the class building. So it, it, to me, it makes a lot of sense. Well, I can imagine also another context in which, let's say, one one claim would be would uh, suffer a haircut and the other one in another right. class would not suffer a haircut and would that would that uh, be still uh, would that be an issue because the, the no. debtor or the person who is actually proposing the restructuring plan or is the restructuring instrument could treat claims separately no no um at least i don't see any issue with this um and once again, in my understanding, it makes, it makes a lot of sense to look at the claim rather than to the persons. I mean, the persons, that is, um, I, mean, I see that as an uh, evolution of the, of the historical development. We always, uh, always have been, ever since ancient Roman times, talking about the debtor and the creditor. And, and therefore, we have personalized it. But as a matter of fact, and in sovereignty, we are dealing with the claims. So, um, no, no, once again, it's a good approach in my understanding. Thank you. If I may, uh, if I may expand a bit, uh, still on the on the affected claims, but uh, to another subtopic of the of the affected claims, the, the directive, especially Article Two, Paragraph Two of the directive, speaks of. Uh, or defines actually the affected parties as creditors whose claims or interests are directly affected by uh, a restructuring plan. Now, this has been a very, very debated topic, especially uh, in our, uh, in our, in the uh, during the uh, the public consultation period with the with the banks, uh, with the banking institutions, because they uh, apparently in in their uh, internal regulations and. Um, in the bylaws passed by the uh, regulatory authority, which is the National Bank in Romania, they have a, a very different approach on whether a claim is affected or not affected, yeah. or not affected. So uh, finally, we, we have proposed uh, quite a narrow approach when it comes to affected claims. Basically, I mean, to put it in simpler terms, it would be a claim that would either suffer a haircut or uh, an extension of the repayment term. Now, uh, again, our question: Would the would that be consistent uh, uh, consistent with the objectives of the directive? Because the directive is is rather uh, is rather uh, not sketchy, but not doesn't really tell what directly affected means. Absolutely. Um, so. Uh... Looking at the at the wording of of the directive, I would fully agree with what you are doing, and uh, saying that that affected is just this, as you described, narrow meaning of those who suffer a haircut or get a change in the in the repayment terms. Um, so that makes a lot of sense, and I have the feeling reading again this the text of the directive, that is what we all had in mind when, when it was drafted. Um, however, the banks, yeah, yeah it, it, it's, it's clear that the banks are coming and saying, we are affected as well. Why are they affected? Because um, they have these regulatory obligations that after 90 days, it's this famous 90 days period, um, they are bound by law to shift any claim which has not been repaid from uh, the one section to the other one, to the, to the um, default uh, section. And then a special mechanism begins, and I'm sure you know it, um, but we have 
written in another book, if, if I may show it to the general audience, mm, please do. It's about best practices in European restructuring. There's a wonderful portion in it, um, which was written by an Italian lady from the Banca d'Italia. Um, she is, I would say, um, Miss Insolvency Law in Italy. She is fantastic. And she has written there what you have to do as a bank in case that there is a 90 days default. And then it's a complete automatism and um, things, the scenery is changing for at least two years. Insofar, the banks are affected indeed in the literal meaning of the word. But if you take, if, if that would be a, a, a reason, an indispensable reason to include the banks as being affected parties in any of the restructuring, then there is no end in sight because affected are also competitors of the entrepreneur. Because if the entrepreneur manages to get a haircut from the creditors, he or she or it will have a better standing on the market. And insofar, the competitors of this entrepreneur are affected as well. So where do you stop if once you open the gates uh, for being affected, meaning, meaning that you have got some impact in, in your business? And therefore, I strongly endorse what you, uh, your approach to come to, to confine it to those to those creditors who have uh, suffered a haircut. So it's this directly affected, which is in the definition of, what is it, uh, Article 2? Uh, Article 2, Paragraph 2. Paragraph 2. And um, insofar, it makes a lot of sense, once again. Well, I think that, I think there's a German author who has, wrote, who has, who has written a, a very nice children's book, Never Ending Story, Michael Ende. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That is true. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so the alternative would be a never-ending story, wouldn't that? Absolutely, absolutely. That's exactly the right. Okay, and one uh, one final question on uh, on the affected unaffected claims. Uh, there is a there is a paragraph that uh, was. I mean, it didn't seem that important in the beginning, but then we have realized. Uh, we have realized that it might raise a lot of problems in uh, in the Romanian economy, which is, as many European economies, uh, an SME economy, yeah. short and medium enterprise. Uh, sorry, small and medium enterprises economy. There is a provision in Article Nine, Paragraph Four, stating that the member states shall put in place appropriate measures to ensure the class formation is done with a particular view to protecting vulnerable creditors such as the small suppliers. Uh, we at this moment, uh, I'm I'm compelled to do a comparison with the insolvency proceedings because that's that's the only thing we've got so far. In the insolvency Romanian insolvency proceedings, we don't have any special provisions uh, protecting the small suppliers. Now, what exactly is the directive talking about here? What was the objective, the aim of the directive to protect, in which manner would the small suppliers be protected? Should should the, the national legislation allow for the formation of a special class uh, when it comes to the restructuring proceedings or could you could you envisage other other means of protecting the small suppliers? Because they are the backbone of uh, Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, I know you 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 said about Michael Ende and the, the in indefinite the unendliche Geschichte in uh, indefinite story. Um, we could go on and go on and go on. It, the small and medium, the SMEs. I mean, they are the backbone not only of the Romanian economy of they are of the entire European. Ninety nine percent of the European economy is SM are SMEs. So insofar, we are talking about an essential, the essential part of the European um, uh, economy. So what are we doing with them? And oh, 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 I guess that the idea behind 
this Article 9, Paragraph 4, has been taken from, from Germany. I, I, I try to remember whether we brought it up in the expert round in 2016 when we got together for the directive. Um, but I don't remember exactly. But I guess that uh, the model has been a, a, a German rule from the German insolvency ordinance. There we have in Article um, 222, um, paragraph three or four. There we have a rule stating that these small creditors, what exactly is it saying? Hold on a sec, please. Um, so it's, it's those shareholders who have less than 1% or up to 1% or claims of less than 1,000 euro. I mean, that is Germany. I mean, you can modify the 1,000. I mean, that is is arbitrary. So you can take 500, you can take 5,000, whatever you want to protect. Um, so that is what, what we have in our setting that uh, there are obligatory classes. You have to build classes. If there is, if there are small creditors, then below 1,000, then you have to form a special class for them. And since the background, the idea behind that is uh, equal treatment is obligatory only within classes, not among classes. And therefore you can vote that, or you can determine that those small creditors receive full payment and the others don't. Um, so that is the idea behind them in order to protect. And, and I would say it makes a lot of sense to uh, protect these vulnerable creditors because vulnerable is is one side of the description. I mean, when the Romanian economy is more or less dependent or consists of those vulnerable creditors, then it's the Romanian economy which is is vulnerable when and if those small companies go go bust. And for that reason, it's it's the vulnerability of the entrepreneurs. At the same time, it's the vulnerability of the economy as a whole. And for that reason, as a, as, as a self-rescue measure, I strongly would advocate that you at least consider to have something like that um, as an obligatory class formation. Oh. So they, they deserve protection and they should get it. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And and not for not just for altruistic reasons. It's not because we are such nice people. We need them. We just need them. It's 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 protecting ourselves um to to protect them. Thank you. If I may uh, if I may go to a, a slightly sure. different topic, still sure. in the area of claims, uh, another topic that has raised uh serious talks this time uh, from the legal from the legal part of uh, of the public was the the notion of uh, contested claims now the contested claims i i i, I must uh, digress a bit here i must uh, bring about the contested claims uh, in the insolvency proceedings are a big issue because uh, we don't uh, our legislation does not require uh, a creditor to be in uh, possession of uh, what the French call titre exécutoire in, our, in order to become a creditor in the insolvency proceedings. So basically uh, anybody can uh, anybody that has a claim liquidated or not liquidated, uh, reduced by a judgment or not reduced by a judgment, anything that looks like a claim, it is to be brought uh, in the insolvency proceedings. Therefore, a lot of claim, uh, a lot of uh, oppositions or objections or what we call in Romanian contestatia appears uh, in regard to uh, such claims. And uh, as the things are standing now in the insolvency proceedings, this is a very lengthy and very uh, difficult process because there is the, the, the insolvency practitioner is doing uh, a first verification of the claims, actually the proof of the proof of, uh, of claims. 
and then anybody can bring an objection to the insolvency judge and the insolvency judge will need to pass a judgment. Now, in theory, this should take a, a short period of time. In practice, it can take months after months after months. So whenever there there is a uh, there, there are like serious insolvency proceedings, a big company, the verification of the claims and the drawing of the final list of creditors may take up to one year, one year and a half. And we certainly wanted to avoid that in the pre-insolvency proceedings. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. So why our proposal was to, instead of an ex ante verification of the claims, like before starting the restructuring, we have opted for a ex post verification of the claims after the reorganization instrument, be it the plan or the agreement, is actually confirmed, voted by the creditors and confirmed by the judge. Our idea behind it was that since is the debtor who is willing to restructure, uh, the, the de such a debtor is actually drawing the list, the debtor should be, uh, should be as honest as possible, uh, acting in perfectly good faith and drawing the list of claims uh, according to its, uh, its books. And should there be any objection, any contestation like, of the claim, that should take place after the, the instrument is starting to be operational. Okay. Again. Yeah. Um, fantastic. I, you, you should, one day you should, are you teaching already? I mean, no, it, no, 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 no. You should, you should. Uh, a Romanian university should take advantage of, of you. I mean, you're explaining things extremely clear and nice. And, and therefore, uh, you should share your knowledge with the, with the next generation. Um, now, let me come, uh, I mean, this is a fantastic, how much time do we have, incidentally? Do you give well, me a couple of hours? Uh, no, probably not. The, the talk should take a, about 30 minutes, but we can extend it. There's no... <laughs> yeah, good. Let's, let's take advantage of the fact that it's recorded. And, uh, oh, good, good, good. And, uh, because you're raising something. I, I have now established with my friend uh, Jay Westbrook um, that we call every two weeks and just in order to have an exchange. So we are discussing various issues. And the last calls have all been around the position and the power of the debtor and the power of the creditors. And I've only recently written, and that was the starting point, I've recently written an article uh, two years ago, an article about the everlasting battle between the power game between the creditors and the debtors. So it's, it's, I mean, when you look at the history of, of the debtor and the creditor, it's always a power game. Um, the, the, the creditors are, per definition, as it were, in the more powerful situation, and creditors uh, make use of it, and they make extensively use of it. And they complain as soon as the legislator is giving a bit more power to the debtor, Whereas the pet debtor itself tries to, to counter attack the creditors in order to get a better position. So that is the difficult, uh, under these circumstances, the difficult task of a legislator to find in a balance between the two of them. Now, um, having said this as a preliminary remark that we are talking about the power game. Um, I would, first of all, draw the conclusion from this preliminary um, words that it's a good sign that the creditors are complaining about what you are planning because it shows you are um, pointing at the right direction. That is where it hurts. So you are right in so far. Secondly, um, as an aside, when you are talking about it takes a year, it takes one and a half years, it takes several months, more than three months. Let Allow me to briefly come back to what I said before where, while we were in the first complex. There you are beyond the, 30, the 90 days period of the banks. That is where the banks are automatically affected in the, in the broad sense because they have to, to switch from this is a claim.
to a defaulting claim. So that is what, what is obligatory. Now, coming to the main issue that you are raising here. Um, what you should be aware of being uh, in the legislative position is do you invite abuse? Who can abuse the system? Or you try to avoid abuse. And abuse can be um, can be taken by by both the creditors and the debtors. Now, if the creditor, the debtor and the creditor can have an advantage of a long period of an automatic stay. Um, what are you doing under these circumstances to get the insolvency proceeding or the restructuring proceeding, whichever, whichever causes an, a stay, um, that you get it done as quickly as possible in order to come back to normal business where the, the balance is kept to a certain degree. And therefore, the interruption should be as short as, as possible. Under these circumstances, I, again, am in the position to tell you from my side what I would conclude. It's a very good idea to have an ex to have a mechanism which is outside of the proceeding. If it's ex post, or if it's outside, beginning already at the time of the contestatia, I don't care. But the the course, the the the, the um, procedure as such, should not be interrupted by by objections, because then these objections can be instrumentalized for purposes which have nothing to do with the with the benefit of of the procedure. So insofar, yes, I would say ex post is good. You could also do, as I said, um, beginning with the contestatia um, outside of the proceeding, but it should be outside of the proceeding. No, I, I, I must, uh, I must uh, step in with another, uh, another. Uh, I, there, there was a third option to leave it to like the regular civil proceedings, but. The, the regular civil proceedings in Romania have two appeals. Like in insolvency, we only have one appeal, okay. which is on both points of facts and points of law. Like the regular civil proceedings, which would be outside the restructuring proceedings, if if the parties could only take take the, the matter to the regular jurisdiction, would would be even more time consuming because it has two appeals. A first uh, a first appeal on points of facts and points of law, and the second one on points of law only. So that would be that was was even more undesirable to put it outside the restructuring proceedings. So our option for the ex post during the restructuring uh, jurisdiction was somehow better than the the civil right. proceedings that would be right. outside the restructuring. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's well, it's striking right. a balance, right? Okay. <gasps> And now for something uh, something rather specific. Uh, this was this was again a hot topic, and uh, the result was pretty much a compromise between, let's say, legal tradition and uh, and uh, the objective uh, of uh, the very generous objective of the directive to have to have like a second shot. If the restructuring plan is not voted by all the creditors, then you can cram it down on the un, uh, unsatisfied, unwilling creditors with a majority. Now, the directive is doesn't set any minimum threshold on the votes. On the maximum. On the other hand, during the insolvency proceedings, the, we have a traditional threshold that was actually lowered in 2014 to 30%. And we have taken it over and included it in the directive. We knew from the very beginning this would be controversial because the directive doesn't set any minimum threshold. Again, is that consistent? Is that, well, is that against the directive's objectives? Because, I mean, a lot of creditors uh, argue, argued that uh, since 
since the direct since since the restructuring plan could be imposed with no minimum threshold it would actually take only one vote that would that is all a very extreme situation but finally it there is one class with one creditor then it's only one vote so yeah, you would right. get a restructuring plan with one vote only so that's why we have thought of this minimum threshold of 30 percent of the total affected uh, claims so I give I give you my personal opinion on that. I mean, everything what I'm saying is personal, and so it's it's, it's nonsense what I'm saying. Apologies. Um, I I have I had all the time also during the expert round. I had certain concerns about this cram down mechanism, uh, this cross class cram down mechanism, because we have taken it over more or less from the from the um, common law system from the English scheme of arrangement. In the English scheme of arrangement, you have two control mechanisms. You have the the, the, the minimum amount um, of 75% and you have the judicial, judicial overview. And I mean, the English judges, like the uh, US American judges, they are different from the continental law judges. I mean, they have been in the business for decades. They know perfectly well what's going on. They are more or less business lawyers. And so they have deep insight into the mechanics, the, but also the economics of any of such transaction. We on the continent with the directive, we have reduced this double control mechanism to one control mechanism. These are the 75%. And insofar, you have my sympathy when you are now introducing a minimum threshold, you have my sympathy because that is something of a kind of, of additional control mechanism um, in order to make life not too easy for, for a debtor. I mean, it's to me, it sounds like um, probably necessary balancing mechanism in order to make life in this ongoing and eternal um, uh, power game between the debtor and creditor in order not to make it too easy for the for the debtor thank you thank you it's enc it's encouraging because uh, this was uh, this was somehow feared that uh, such a threshold would be regarded as contrary to the objectives of the directive no okay thank you and uh one uh, final question uh on a on a different topic from the directive this time on the topic of discharge yeah uh well discharge uh is a separate topic in the directive it it could be linked to the restructuring but it could as well be treated in at least that's how we've seen it as a different topic so we have tried to link it to relate it to another type of uh, proceedings so far uh, in the romanian insolvency proceedings the discharge is uh, merely an effect a consequence of the of the closing of the proceedings and um, we have tried to enhance it the directive imposes such a mechanism so the discharge should be available at least to the entrepreneurs uh, the entrepreneurs did not have so far in the insolvency Romanian proceedings uh, any access to a restructuring. And this is one of the main changes we are actually proposing to offer any type of entrepreneur, no matter how small, no matter what his, his or her situation is, access to restructuring proceedings and theref therefore access to discharge. So our approach was not to create a separate mechanism, separate discharge mechanism in the in the bill, but to offer access to the existing discharge to, to entrepreneurs that did not have access so far. They can either they can go for either liquidation or reorganization, uh, but the end would be discharge. The only thing is that the directive seems to hint uh, to a uh, three-year limit or a time limit, a, li uh, a limited uh, period of time available, and then the discharge should go automatic. 
Now, the problem is that we have actually no control over the duration of the restructuring or the liquidation proceedings in the actual insolvency uh, act. So should there be a time limit for the discharge? Shouldn't there be? Or should should we have like a determinable period of time? Not in three years, but let's say anything between three and five. What, what is I your opinion? If you allow me to answer by beginning with giving you the German example, we have now introduced, we well, we started 22 years ago, 23 years ago. We started with seven years. Um, and then we thought it's a little bit long and reduce it to five years. And, and now, because of the directive, we have reduced it to three years. Because that is my reading that the three years is obligatory. There should be a possibility for entrepreneurs um, to have a three year period discharge. However, you can add, of course, you can make it dependent on a couple of, of circumstances. It must be the honest creditor, uh, debtor, it must, uh, uh, there, there must be no, no no fraud, no nothing, and compliance with all the rules and requirements and what have you. So that is what is allowable. But um, the, there should be one proceeding. What I would say in this context, and that's what I understood between the lines, what you were saying, that you keep it in the insolvency law and that it's not in the restructuring section of the law. I mean, my only concern in this regard is, and I can't say anything about it, how strong is the, the negative impact of insolvency? I mean, if to have the possibility, but to go through hell in order to make use of this possibility, that is a disaster, and then you can forget about it. So I would say it depends a little bit on the stigma of insolvency. Um, the directive started with the intent to have the, the negative impact, the negative connotations with insolvency, which is very predominant in Europe, to reduce it further. So that is for the last couple of years, if not decades, the main driver of the com of the commission, they want to reduce the the negative impact of, of insolvency proceedings, and so if that is guaranteed by your pro uh, approach, I would say that's fine. And all what the directive is saying, in my understanding, is there should be one possibility to have the proceeding uh, to 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 get access to a three years discharge. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a very useful talk. And uh, if, if it's all right with you, we'll stop here and maybe we'll just remain a couple of minutes to discuss uh, sure. some, uh, some, some administrative issues. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope we do have your agreement to transcribe it and uh, publish it. Certainly, certainly. It is a great pleasure. It's always a great pleasure to talk to you, my dear friend. Thank you. I hope to see you in Dublin at the Insol Europe. I will see. I will. I'm working on it. That I